Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Section 10 of David Hume's Enquiry Concerning Human Understanding is titled On Miracles, and it's divided into two main parts. He's setting out a problem, and the question isn't simply, do miracles exist or not, but do we have good grounds for thinking in any given case that a miracle has actually taken place? And this is connected with this conception of testimony. We learn a lot of things, not through our own direct experience, but by being reported to us, offered to us, you could say, in various kinds of literature, or nowadays it could be you know, through videos or other things like that. And he begins by talking about this Dr. Tillotson uh, arguing against the real presence. We're not going to worry so much about that. But he says that um, you know, a decisive argument of this kind, which must at least silence bigotry and superstition, you know, is, is something good. And he says, I flatter myself. I have discovered an argument of a like nature, which, if just, will, with the wise and learned, be an everlasting check to all kinds of superstitious delusion, and consequently will be useful as long as the world endures. For so long, I presume, will the accounts of miracles and prodigies be found in history sacred and profane. So that, that's his goal, right? He's constructing an argument. And before we get to the point where Hume is actually going to ultimately provide us with reasons for rejecting testimony bearing upon what appear to be miracles, we have to do a little bit of stage setting. And that's what he's doing in the first section here, primarily. So you can look at this as expository rather than simply argumentative. And he begins by talking about experience, which he's been running through in the entire work. Experience can be our only guide in, in reasoning concerning matters of fact. And he says that this guide is not altogether infallible, but in some cases can lead us into errors. And he provides as an example, one who in our climate, that of Scotland, should expect better weather in any week of June than in one of December, would reason justly and conformably to experience, but it is certain that he may happen in the event to find himself mistaken. We can have freak occurrences where, you know, it's warmer in December than it is in June, or pick whatever else you want. Sometimes things go wrong. And he says, we can observe in such a case, he would have no cause to complain of experience because it commonly informs us of the uncertainty by that contrariety of events, which we may learn by a diligent, diligent observation. What, what is a contrariety? Things not turning out as we would expect them. They can contradict each other, right? So he says, all effects follow not with like certainty from their supposed causes. Some events are found in all countries and all ages, constantly conjoined together. Others are found to have been more variable, sometimes to disappoint our expectations. And he says, you know, we're stuck most of the time with probability, something that he discussed earlier in uh, section six, right? So, you know, what we ought to do, because experience is variable, he says, we should proportion our belief to the evidence. This is what he says a wise person does. And so he says, in conclusions that are founded on an infallible experience. Now, it's hard to see where there could be an infallible experience, given Hume's uh, other things that he said about experience. But let's just go with him on that. So if there is an infallible experience, we expect the event with the last degree of assurance. And we regard past experience as a full proof 
of the future existence of that event. Okay, so if we've never been disappointed by experience, we can say, okay, it's going to turn out this way in the future. But if it's merely probable, if things sometimes aren't quite so constant, he says, well, then he weighs the opposite experiments. He considers which side is supported by the greater number of experiments. And now he doesn't mean a scientific experiment with a very rigid methodology. He just means experiences, right? And so he says uh, he inclines to the side which is supported by the greater number. To that side, he inclines with doubt and hesitation. And when he fixes his judgment, the evidence exceeds not what we call probability. So we can say, well, I'm 90% certain, or I'm pretty certain that this will be the case. That's proportioning belief to evidence. So he says we can consider a particular instance. What is the particular instance? Well, it's actually something quite general. So particular might be a little misleading here. He says that we may observe there is no species of reasoning more common, more useful, and even necessary to human life than that which is derived from the testimony of men and the reports of eyewitnesses and spectators. Now, let's pause there for a moment. How do we know probably 99% of the things that we believe, that we say we actually do know? Well, it is in large respect based on testimony, people saying this is the case, or like he says, reports by eyewitnesses and spectators, or it's reports about what other people have reported, and we can go on and on and on with this. And he says, this species of reasoning uh, one may deny to be founded on the relation of cause and effect, but I'm not going to dispute about that. It will be sufficient to observe our assurance in any arguments of this kind is derived from no other principle than our observation of the veracity of human testimony, right? So we have a lot of experiences of people saying, yes, this is the case. And then we go and we check it out. And it turns out that actually is the case. And we're like, yeah, okay, cool. And so we can rely on most people being truthful with us most of the time in most circumstances, right? And the conformity, as he says, a usual conformity of facts to the reports of witnesses. And so he says, it, it being a general maxim, no objects have any discoverable connection together and all the inferences we can draw on from one to another founded on the experience of their constant and regular conjunction. We shouldn't make an exception to this maxim in favor of human testimony whose connection with any event seems as little necessary as any other. So why do we believe what other people tell us? Because in large part, we have found them to be more or less reliable. What do we do, however, when we're confronted with what he calls a contrariety of evidence where there are different people saying different things, even contradictory things about the same event or same sequence of events. He says, well, there's a lot of different factors involved in this, right? So um, how do we decide about this? Uh, he says that there's a number of different possibilities. The contrariety of evidence may be derived from different causes from the opposition or contradiction of contrary testimony. So people say a lot of different things about something and we're like, well, I don't know quite who to believe, right? Or we might be attending to, as he says, the character or number of witnesses, right? or uh, from their manner of delivering their testimony or the union of all of these circumstances in real life situations, there may in fact be a number of these playing a role. And he, he sums this up by saying, we entertain a suspicion concerning any matter of fact when the witnesses contradict each other, when they have but few or of doubtful character, when they have an interest in what they affirm, when you know they're saying things that would be nice for them to be true, when they deliver their testimony with hesitation, or on the contrary, with too violent asservations. They're being too, um, we could say, emphatic 
in how they're telling us that. So we should be kind of on edge, kind of suspicious when, when that's the case. So there's a lot of things he says where, you know, maybe we don't buy them. And he, he goes on and he says, um, suppose that the fact which the testimony endeavors to establish partakes of the extraordinary, the marvelous, in that case, the evidence resulting from the testimony admits of a diminution greater or less in proportion as the fact is more or less unusual. So, you know, for example, spontaneous human combustion. Is that a real thing or not? And people were very worried about that in the 1970s. I remember quite a few relatives being concerned with that. And he says, well, the reason we place any credit in witnesses and historians is not derived from any connection we perceive a priori between testimony and reality, but because we're accustomed to find a conformity between them. So when something kind of crazy happens, we're like, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to buy that, you know, unless we're rather credulous people or we're, you know, we're relying on somebody's character as, you know, not um, being uh, impeachable or impunable, which usually turns out to be false. And Hume is going to go on and he talks about the difference between the marvelous, something being only marvelous, and something being really miraculous. These are not the same thing for him. Something that's marvelous, I mean, it could be the case, it could not be the case. It doesn't imply a violation of the laws of nature, because that is what makes a miracle a miracle in Hume's eyes. This is how he defines a miracle. A miracle is a violation of the laws of nature, he says. A little bit later in a footnote, he's going to add to this. He says, a miracle may accurately be defined as a transgression of a law of nature by a particular volition of the deity or the interposition of some invisible agent. It's kind of, you know, adding to that definition. But the idea here is that there's laws of nature that we human beings can uncover and a miracle contradicts them. A miracle violates them. It's not just something interesting or rare. It's something that really shouldn't be at all. So he says, as a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws, the proof against a miracle from the very nature of the fact is as entire as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined. So, you know, you could say that by definition for Hume, a miracle can't be true. You can't have uh, a violation of the laws of nature. And he, you know, there's a lot of examples of this. One of the examples that he gives is a dead person coming back to life, a really dead person, not just somebody who we think is dead and we accidentally bury them or something where we're mistaken. That's not a violation of the laws of nature. That's actually following the laws of nature. But a dead person, a genuinely dead person being resurrected or however we're going to say it, um, he says that is a violation. Um, it's never been observed in any age or country. And here we might say, well, wait a second, people have said that they've observed this sort of thing. We can think of all sorts of examples. We might think of the biblical example of Jesus telling Lazarus to come out of the tomb. Uh, doesn't that count? And Hume would say, well, we need to look into this more carefully. And he tells us that um, a miracle is not actually going to happen. Why? He says there must be a uniform experience against every miraculous event. Otherwise, the event would not merit that appellation. So by the very way in which we're understanding miracle, there's going to be experiences against it. And he says, as a uniform experience amounts to a proof, here is direct and full proof from the nature of the fact against the existence of any miracle, nor can any proof be destroyed or the miracle rendered credible by an opposite proof, which is Superior. So this is where he's actually heading in the next section where he's going to give arguments. And he does have this interesting footnote that we should discuss. In the footnote, he points out that sometimes an event may not in itself seem to be contrary to the laws of nature, yet 
If it were real, it might, by reason of some circumstances, be denominated, that is called a miracle, because in fact, as opposed to how it seems, it is contrary to those laws. So he says, if a person claiming a divine authority should command a sick person to be well, a healthful man to fall down dead, the clouds to pour rain, the winds to blow, uh, in short, should order many natural events which immediately follow on his command, these might justly be esteemed miracles. Why? Because they really are contrary to the laws of nature. Um, they're a transgression of, of that. Somebody saying something shouldn't make these effects happen, right? The last thing that he's going to say here, and this is leading us into the next section where he's going to directly attack miracles based on testimony. He says, the plain consequence is, and he says, this is a general maxim worthy of our attention. No testimony, no testimony at all is sufficient to establish a miracle unless there is a particular condition of that testimony. And now notice the way that he frames this. This is very important. No testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact it endeavors to establish. Right? So when somebody tells me he saw a dead man restored to life, I consider with myself whether it be more probable, the alternate theory, that this person should either deceive or be deceived, or the fact which he relates should have really happened. I weigh, as he says, one miracle against another. So when somebody is providing testimony about a miracle, I have to say, well, what is actually more likely that this person is deceived or deceiving, or maybe there was some sort of weird, you know, natural law explicable event, or that an actual miracle took place. And unless it's more likely that a miracle took place, we're not gonna accept that sort of testimony. This, Hume says, can be a general maxim, so something that we rely upon. Uh, as a rule of thumb, you could say. And so this is about as far as he gets in section one. He has set up his understanding of miracles and its relation to probability and to testimony.